Well, hello and welcome to the podcast. As always, we are honored to have the one and only Mr. Estian on joining us for the month to discuss all things financial and geopolitical throughout the whole of the world and in America. And if you are new to the channel, please do like, subscribe, and share so that it grows the channel and others can get the knowledge you are afforded. And also hit the customization button so that you won't miss a single one of these reports. Mr. SG, welcome to the channel, brother. And how are you doing today? Doing well, my friend. Thank you for having me back. Always a pleasure. I look forward to it. I know our audience does as well. Well, SG, in our last discussion last month, uh, you opined along with myself about when uh, Iran and Israel were going to sort of go at it with counterattacks. And I believe you said 30 to 40 days, and you've called it because now here we sit in the thick of it. Additionally, you mentioned the China-Taiwan China -Taiwan short conflict, and President Trump mentioned optically, as you know, that it was going to occur after the Olympics, which I believe ends this week. Uh, and then you have Judge Torres about to render her inevitable decision to release XRP of any clear wrongdoing in a pointless witch hunt by the SEC. Then the Fed will start to likely drop interest rates a half a point in September going throughout the rest of the year. All of this is culminating towards a currency, cryptos, and metals reset, among other things, right in front of us. Now, I heard on your last file, 78, you were talking about a lot of these events within the first half hour of your broadcast. With that said, SG, how do you see all this playing out over the remainder of the summer into the fall for the benefit of the people? Well, you know, fundamentally, I think that as we, you know, escalate towards the period of the U.S. presidential election, we're going to see that last home stretch that's known, I think, in NASCAR racing or stock car racing as the back stretch uh, movement or, the, excuse me, the front stretch movement towards the, the inevitable finish line. And so everybody gives it their all. It's always the last 10 seconds of the horse race derby, right? It's always the last few seconds of any sort of competition that make the headlines, set the precedent, because it's those last few seconds leading up to the moment of victory, defeat, or whichever perspective you happen to be at that define the actions which occur going forward. So what do we have right now? We have a concentrated effort happening uh, under the auspices of multiple regional conflicts breaking out, it's a concentrated effort to permanently destroy the underpinnings of the dollar. I think we can say that unequivocally, that has been a, a remarkably massive success. And with the installation that we've seen uh, and the incompetence that we've seen coming out of what is ostensibly the Washington, D.C.-based U.S. government, we have a situation happening where uh, that standard component, that third arm, if you will, of the empire of the three cities, which has been the military might of Washington, D.C., has been effectively neutered uh, for a great deal of this. Additionally, we have evidence to show from Trump's executive orders post-presidency that at least some and potentially a great amount of the military forces of the United States inside the chains of command are actually divided amongst one another. Um, so all of that happening, you have the perfect addition. You have literally um, I would say the ideal perfect storm worldwide, when you add in the asset capabilities of trading blocks like BRICS, the industrial manufacturing capabilities of, of many nations out there in the world, uh, Russia, China, and India, of course, being three of the big ones that are in BRICS, uh, what you've got is, is the landscape to you know, permanently disempower that dollar hegemony and also to fundamentally reshape the idea of world currency. At the end of the day, what we've always had is a reserve currency where a great deal of the planet does business in a certain currency. Prior to the dollar, it was the British pound of the, the British royal empire. Um, moving forward, the idea, I think, for the world is to create a balanced situation where there's not necessarily a reserve currency, but a reserve measurement of value exchange that everybody agrees to adhere to, which, of course, would come back to the concept of precious metals, commodities, and tangible assets, and real reflectable resources being properly valued at worldwide markets. That's why what's happening with Zimbabwe, what's happening with Iraq, what's happening with Turkey's accession into BRICS, uh, essentially all but formalized with the, the final documents uh, being signed. All of these point to a landscape that's fundamentally shifting, not only in removing the dollar, but in redefining how international trade is standardized in a way that nations will trust one another in that process. And so you asked, what can we see and expect to the lead up to the election, expect to the people out there? I think we have to look at the perspective of what people were talking about from the NATO and Western world. You're going to see additional uh, um, 
air sort of pumped into that balloon, right? You're seeing more and more spigots turned off. You're seeing a growing military threat right now in the Middle East. We're in right now that Iranian is really con conflict, which, which will eventually involve Turkey, uh, which I believe Turkey will primarily step into the conflict to prevent both sides from destroying one another. Um, I think that this is going to be relatively intense, relatively quickly, personally, there in the Middle East. But what that does is it completely destroys the underpinning of the worldwide intelligence community. It interrupts the Suez Canal security, which is responsible for a tremendous amount of trade. It essentially makes the Gulf of Aqaba intransitable. It makes the Gulf of Hormuz intransitable. Um, and you're talking about the opportunity with China having a very heavy involvement in arms dealing and and resource uh, exchange throughout those Middle Eastern nations. That's the perfect opportunity if you are the Chinese in Beijing to launch upon your own campaigns, because when those events occur in the Middle East and in, in the, uh, the Fertile Crescent areas of the world, and we see a lot of that shipping and a lot of those secure regions essentially put on a military style lockdown, You'll see reverberations in the worldwide finance markets, coupled with the weakness that already exists in those Western loyalist Pacific nations, specifically the stock exchanges out of Tokyo and out of Seoul. So moving this process through, you're going to see one set of people around the world benefiting very highly from this. You're going to see a meteoric rise in the quality of life from nations such as Zimbabwe, such as Iraq, such as Turkey when all of this is over potentially even Iran when all of this is over, where you have a, a, a standard of, of living and a quality of living that uh, balances itself out to the point where people want to improve upon their own, right? And that's the goal of the entire Great Awakening. And yet at the same time, you will experience the destructuring of the central nodes of that system from the other perspective, from the Western world, and that will galvanize the need to iron out what went wrong to understand culturally how this impacted our countries so that we can build a brighter future together tomorrow. It's actually a really beautiful process. It begins over the next really fervently over the next 90 to 120 days. But I would suspect that even as we move into a new Trump presidency or a post-November 2024 uh, post-election period, depending on how that landscape actually turns itself out, we'll actually be moving more into an interpretive lens of commerce and economy building that will last us decades. Yeah, I, I like what you said with that. And also, you know, it's moves and counter moves. Don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing, because I do agree that uh, Iran eventually, when this is done, the sanctions will be coming off of them and their people will be freed up as well. I think there'll be a, a period of rest between both Iraq and Iran, you know, when the dust settles, as you said. Uh, you also have Iraq very, you know, quietly and surreptitiously uh, pushing in their HCL, uh, you know, oil and gas laws with 150 laws behind that, getting a new Speaker of the House. I believe Sudani today is pushing for a new central bank governor because the old one is a uh, Iranian proxy, which is you know part of what this whole exercise, as you know, wholly with respect to Iran and Israel is all about. Is is people will think it's World War III, but it's actually the liberation of a lot of these economic systems. To your point, um, next question would be SG: Is you have President Trump saying over and over with blatant comms that he's going to remove taxes on Social Security, tips, and really just remove the the income tax altogether, which we know is fraudulent, has never really been part of the government, let less the Constitution. He's also openly uh, discussing helping the farmers. Uh, he had mentioned the other day that he's flirting with the idea of paying off the $35 trillion debt with a little Bitcoin, which he said sort of, as you know, jocularly. Wouldn't this be a clear indication, SG, of not only Nassara, but the aforementioned items that have already occurred in his first term, and now he's just really rolling them out for people to know optically what's coming on within the incoming months of his return? Well, honestly, John, you took the word sort of right out of my mouth with that, with respect to the fact that we are priming the public narrative for events that have already occurred. We absorbed the Federal Reserve into the U.S. Treasury in 2020 as, as a result of wartime national emergency actions. And we have been taking coordinated action worldwide, both in a civilian and in a militarized sense, based on a lot of the actionable intelligence and the actionable landscape that existed in 2019 and 2020. So looking forward now, you know, we have to consider that while the agencies themselves may still have personnel who are at home getting paid, and while there may be, you know, pencil pushers who have not been, who are sort of none the wiser to what's actually occurring, fundamentally what's happening here is I think the public process for um, 
you know, ending the Fed, ending the IRS, moving into a constitutional treasury based system where we have sales tax internally and we have tariffs externally. And that's exactly what President Trump has been talking about. And for hundreds of years, that was really the best and fairest way to trade. If you bought internally from your own manufacturing, it was cheaper because it was cheaper to, to have it on site versus when you imported something as a foreign good. It's one of the reasons also that foreign luxuries gained the type of uh, um, reputation that they did and why they were so highly desirable by individuals that did have money. Uh, so moving through this process, we're actually moving back, I think, to a system that reflects some of the better spirits of the old system, but discards the greed, the usury, the need and the lust for um, the material side of things in the process, because one cannot, you know, operate in a service oriented fashion uh, worldwide. And, and I think that's in a, in a fundamental, you know, a, a spiritually oriented nature that's appropriate for mankind in the new system, unless we have that service oriented fashion. That's what I'm trying to say. So moving through um, what President Trump's statements are, you know, we have to remember that the Office of Military Settlements reconciled the net, the a great deal of the debt, I think it was to the tune of twenty one and a half trillion dollars. And we have documents to show that that was an active process that occurred, I believe it was December of 2017. So now we have to go through the receivership of the old dead corporate entity into the republic, and we have to involve, we have to sort of sink all of it into that constitutional lens, which is why I mentioned the Treasury just a moment ago. So President Trump is giving us, I think, that irregular warfare on understanding that we're operating out of this old narrative, we're operating out of a, a sort of an, a, if I could even use the term, perhaps a, a post Reagan uh, political landscape egregore that's been created in the consciousness of America, this galvanized right versus left conservative versus Democrat or versus liberal progressive or whatever. We still even see a lot of that terminology at use fundamentally today. But really what we're dealing with is the movement from an entirely old way of life into a new and constitutionally balanced way of life. But in order to uh, in order to accomplish that, we've had to take extraordinary leaps and bounds that then require a little bit of preparation for people to understand and digest. Absolutely, it, it is a process. And uh, I think that's like you said, he's kind of gearing people up psychologically to what's not only coming, but what's already occurred to your point. Um, in, our, in our community and with our channel on Telegram, we've shown people distinct evidence of the, the fact that um, the President Trump did in fact bake the Fed into the Treasury, as you said, back in 2019, 2020, because now you will see it says Department of Treasury Internal Revenue Service, which is, you know, wholly different from Federal Reserve IRS, you know, words do matter, as you are well aware. Um, <clears throat> so we've been saying in our Camp SG for a while and our team that uh, for a couple of years that we believe wholly that real estate, both commercially and residentially, would drop somewhere between 85 to 95% across the board. Now you're seeing subject matter experts, some of which we've had on our broadcasts, like uh, Lynette Zhang, Peter Schiff, Greg Manorino, just to name a few, are sort of repeating the exact same refrain. Do you see this as well in your purview of information? And if so, do you think it's a natural component of the SARA or the big banks failing altogether, or maybe a little of both? I did have a little bit of an audio interruption there, my friend. I apologize. If you don't, if you don't mind, do you care to repeat the question? Sure, sure, no problem. So what I was saying, SG, is that we've been saying in our camp for a while now, for the last I don't know, a couple of years, in our team, uh, that we believe that the real estate market, specifically commercial and residential, would be dropping somewhere between eighty-five to ninety-five percent across the board. And now, ironically, you're hearing that refrain from subject matter experts, some of which we've had in our broadcast, people like Lynette Zhang, Greg Manorino, uh, Peter Schiff, just to name a few. Um, so I'm wondering if you see this as well. And if you do, do you see it as a natural component of Nasara or the big banks failing or maybe a little of both? I think fundamentally, I would I would look at the the mortgage market and the housing markets, especially the subprime, as um, fundamentally intrinsic to both situations. You have the existence of the commercial cash instruments, which is a mortgage note, and it's worth for the audience out there remembering that as a mortgage note bearing a signature from a living person, it becomes a cash instrument on deposit with the bank. So 
understanding then that that is a, a huge component of the fraudulent system. It's a huge component of how Treasury has been complicit, actually, in the overthrow of the Constitution of the United States through giving away, essentially, the entire control of our financial sector. The U.S. bonds take a lot of the same template, and the Treasury bond market worldwide is sort of the macro version of the same Ponzi scheme that we're talking about. So seeing the housing market coming down, what is that going to do? That's going to reflect a tremendous amount of uh, overinflated value across the board. It's going to highlight ledger books as being remarkably laundered. Uh, I think you're going to see incestuous relationships between financial organizations out of Wall Street or originating from Wall Street ancillary to banks doing closet door business with the bank themselves, sort of washing the money that way. All of this falling out exposes a grand you know, majority of it, much in the same way that the Madoff a scandal of many years ago exposed what was actually occurring with Fannie Mae, with Freddie Mac, and with some of these same markets and financial instruments. So the Federal Reserve then being left holding the FDIC bag because all of the banks will, of course, tank on their mortgage loans and their stock shorts, which will be, I think, revealed to be in trillions of dollars against commodity commodity markets worldwide. You have the FDIC, you have the Federal Reserve System that will primarily be left holding the bag and being responsible and accountable for all of these uh, events because the, the ability of the government to bail out the entire crisis is not uh, large enough, I think, or is not expansive enough to encompass the crisis itself. And that even includes the bail-ins, which are allowed under the Dodd-Frank Act. And people for, tend to forget that the bail-in component, while it would uh, certainly provide the incentive out there for a great deal of public wrath, even it will not be able to stop the, the crumbling of some of these markets because you have a sort of debt instrument fraud that is supporting debt instrument fraud that is supporting debt instrument fraud. So it becomes this circular reinforcing set of lies. And everyone out there sort of intuitively understands that you can only continue to tell lies so long before they begin to crumble out from underneath themselves. The exact principle exists here, except in a more uh, tangible and in a much more serious fashion. I, and I don't want to you know, understate that out there for the audience. But at the same time, when we see this, these markets come down to a point of actionable or to a point of actual uh, reconcilable values, and we have a a clear picture of not only what occurred, but what the actual property values out there may be in accord with local assessors, in accord with community notes and property records, right? Things that we wouldn't have to dig very far to have. Then fundamentally, I think what you're setting up is actually the biggest housing boom that will ever be seen in American history. You'll have essentially a, a national fire sale for those individuals who are capable of maintaining themselves through the crisis. And I don't just mean financially with that. It's going to be a mental journey and a spiritual journey as well. But the I think the promised land, if we want to use the term, the milk and honey on the other side, is a true, uh, if I can use the cliche, John, a true 1950s style America, except without the war horse of the military industrial complex controlling our daily lives. I think you just said it uh, perfectly there, SG, and, and uh, encapsulated a lot. So thanks again for, for that. Um, so one of the last financial questions before we pivot into some of the geopolitical matters, uh, as you know, more and more countries are adopting XRP. Even the U.S. government is admitting plans to put billions into the purchase of it. India last week became one of the first countries to buy oil with XRP, clearly moving away from the U.S. dollar scam or hedge money, as you said. A Bank of America, what's left of them, is now adopting XRP as a form of payment. What does this mean to you in terms of both the short and long-term financial landscape? Well, considering that it was, I think it was Warren Buffett who dumped a tremendous amount of holdings in Bank of America just in the last 36 hours. And we have the SEC case, of course, coming to a, a pretty you know, interesting and permanent close. Uh, this on top of the fact, sort of in an ancillary fashion, that Google was just recently found guilty of antitrust laws or a violation violation of antitrust laws here in the United States, which will set the precedent for antitrust actions within Silicon Valley. We know a tremendous amount of Silicon Valley is going to have to be either captured and repurposed or completely redesigned and reimagined in order to allow for things like P2P secure exchange, but the protection of privacy, constitutional rights, and sovereignty over one's own assets. And so I'm looking at all of these different factors, John, as in a very hopeful way. It's it's not been that long ago that President Trump was talking at the Bitcoin conference, and he talked about the importance of what he characterized as digital entrepreneurs 
uh, sort of building the American dream, pioneering this new way of life, this new development, which much of that message was, of course, tailored to the audience itself. But fundamentally, he's also giving us a, a pretty gigantic clue there that this component of our landscape moving forward, the digital quantum component of our lifestyle will need individuals out there who are gifted in those ways who understand conceptually mechanically perhaps intuitively the nature of those things and how they can contribute and step up so i'm extremely hopeful quite frankly about the future of xrp specifically and of the and of the, the entire ripple venture um, it's not my personal wheelhouse, so I don't want to inappropriately speculate on it. But we know that fundamentally XRP is a is an instrument for fluidity of transaction. It's an instrument for inst for essentially enabling instantaneous secure uh, communication across borders, across pathways. BRICS is sort of pioneering and outlining right now a very large international interblock. Uh, entirely quantum system. It's not fully come online yet. We've got the the Bank of Russia, I believe, actually, that is sort of late to the party with that. But, you know, looking at the the future landscape and that rebalancing of the world uh, that we were discussing just earlier, you know, with reference to the the fairness of the markets and how one side sort of is winning at the same time that the other side is losing as we both come to this midpoint, or as as all sides, rather, is a better way to say it, come to that midpoint. I'm extremely encouraged and optimistic for what this means. I'm also encouraged in the sense that we have the willingness now of the, the digital space. We have the willingness of individuals out there to educate themselves on how a marriage between both the physical and the digital is possible. And so in a way, we're sort of uh, serving as, as the largest grassroots beta test or the largest grassroots build out experiment in all of human history for the concept of value exchange in a multidimensional way. So John, fundamentally, while we've got some turbulence ahead of us, this is very, very exciting looking forward. No, I agree completely. Now you're the one that's taking the words out of my mouth because yes, XRP is definitely going to be the uh, epicenter of the blockchain. That's going to be the movement for all of these transactions, trillions of frames in under seconds or in, in within a second uh, to move this new digital economic reality. So uh, based on assets, I should say specifically. So thank you for um, articulating on that. Okay, shifting over a little bit, SG, to the geopolitical side of things. The Brunson case, as you may know, was decided uh, internally this year with the Supreme Court and with the Brunson family winning decisively. Apparently, Supreme Court is working uncharacteristically longer hours during the summer than they would normally do. Do you expect them to come out and announce this decision sooner than later? And if so, wouldn't that inherently mean that there wouldn't be an election as President Trump would automatically be reinstated and prove that the 2020 election was fraudulent, as we all know? You know, it cut off there at the very end of the question, but I think you were asking me specifically about the release of the the timing of the release for the Brunson decision and how that may play into the election as we come into November. Correct. You know, with respect to the timing, I think it's it's very suspect and it's very interesting that we have the justices performing extended hour sessions. We have Congress taking unexpected, essentially last minute early recesses. Uh, we've had the Supreme Court now issued a press statement refusing to delay uh, any sort of sentencing hearings pertaining to President Trump until after the election itself. So we could be looking at the setup for uh, both demonstrating, you know, the completion of an insurrection or the completion of an overthrow of the government through allowing some some sort of sentencing to take place with Trump immediately prior to the election itself, and then a simultaneous salvation of it with the Supreme Court's October session. If I'm not mistaken, the October session comes sort of towards the middle of the month. Um, and so we could, and that's right after that October 4th date, I believe. So we're looking at, I think, the timing uh, being probably immediately before the election itself happening. And I think one of the reasons that that would be very, very interesting timing, and I want to I want to highlight for the audience, John, that it's not a hard and fast prediction, but it, it seems seems sort of a logical conclusion. The timing coming into that October session is going to be uh, essentially right before the election itself. You've got as two to three weeks, I think, primarily, maybe even less than that, the election itself, by the time we get there, provided we get there in the current sense at all, we're going to have financial turbulence that has played into things. We've certainly got uh, pockets of destabilization across American society that are being highlighted in a pretty loud and, and boisterous way. I would expect those pockets to grow uh, in intensity and, and perhaps even in scope. Um, 
by the time we get to that election season, we're going to have a country that I think a lot of people are just ready to change. A lot of people are ready to save. A lot of people are ready to get behind and, and really work, you know, do their civic duty, roll their sleeves up and really work on being a part of that. And that's been sort of the one of the you know ancillary uh, goals and objectives of this entire operation, not primary, but certainly an ancillary and important one. So if we were to see the Supreme Court rule that the administration over the past four years has been an illegitimate regime and is and is in fact an insurrection and an overthrow of the United States government, and then that illegitimate body refuse to step down, perhaps even attempt to cause some sort of mass event or facilitate some sort of uh, large destabilization immediately prior to or during uh, the week of the election, we could see justification through that, you know, through that force and through those mechanisms to see domestic deployment of the military on behalf of terrorism. You know, a DOJ memo from 1023-2001 describes the lawful conditions and the lawful authorities needed to actually engage the National Guard forces of the U.S. Army in a forward-postured, militarized fashion. And the memo discusses that the Posse Comitatus Act, which is the primary uh, bulwark against some sort of military warlord championing into D.C. like Caesar did with the Rubicon, that act only applies to law enforcement activities. But what happens when authorities at the local and state level are no longer capable of responding to the growing civil unrest? The Insurrection Act of 1807 outlines that when that occurs, it is the primary job of the military to preserve and defend the republic, and that means the union itself. And so we could have a situation developing as a result of a Brunson decision and perhaps even a concurrent financial event. I would imagine that markets worldwide would take a pretty immediate tank if the U.S. government were found illegitimate by the Supreme Court of the United States. If we were to see those events take place and then provide a basis for some sort of large destabilization in a significant fashion around our country, this could be all the justification needed to press the pause button on society that a lot of patriots out there have been sort of wondering when that's going to come, you know, when the other shoe is going to drop since November of 2020. Yeah, and I think you're probably right over the target with that. And maybe this is a good dovetailing question, SG, to what you were just discussing with respect to the Brunson case. Um, regarding the U.S. National Guard units, we had heard for a while that they were deployed in every state and that they were uh, sort of on the ready. We haven't heard much about them, at least I haven't, in, in, in recent dealings. So I'm, I'm wondering if you know if they still have presence within each respective state are they still on high alert to the best of your knowledge? And, and what do you see their role being during this uh, uh, seminal point in history? Well, as it pertains directly to the National Guard itself, the National Guard is continuing in a forward postured, highly active uh, fashion all across the United States. It's not been three or four weeks ago now, maybe just a little bit over three weeks ago that we saw activation of the Pennsylvania uh, National Guard, a unit of the Pennsylvania National Guard uh, from the Pittsburgh area, uh, and I'd like to highlight that for the audience out there, and that unit was dispatched to Guantanamo Bay for prisoner protection and force reinforcement on site. Um, the unit was a component of the military police unit of the National Guard uh, component that was there on site in Pennsylvania that was activated. And so it's worth noting that just a couple of weeks later, we saw the attempted assassination of President Trump in Pennsylvania, Butler, Pennsylvania, on the 13th of July. So I said three weeks. I guess at this point, it's been a little bit closer to five or six. That being said, that's just one example of literally scores of different articles you can pull up from military.com, uh, army.mil, airforce.mil other military associated websites, which publish press releases about various activities and specifically training operations. And we know from uh, our entity online that has given us sort of that irregular warfare lens and that understanding of, of much broader lever levers of power here in the world, that um, the components of the, the training operation components of a lot of these, these operations are in fact live action military pursuits. Um, the Marine Corps, for example, has been engaged in an internal struggle against the, the CIA and various turncoat factions of the Pentagon since 2018. And I have an archived video of Marine Corps Ospreys storming CIA headquarters Langley in Virginia uh, in a shock and off, you know, quick reaction force style campaign. It was three Ospreys set themselves down and Marines began running off of the, the planes and storming the building. 
So we know that there's been a highly active component of the National Guard involved in this because of Trump's executive orders. We know that our entity online discusses the concept of the National Guard working in coordination with the Marine Corps specifically uh, to accomplish certain actions that have to be accomplished with respect not only to civilian law, but also military jurisdiction. A tremendous amount of U.S. flag officer command that was captured or corrupted over the last 30 to 50 year period has been highly uh, targeted and focalized in these operations. We've had more than 150 commanders now uh, removed for loss of confidence in the ability command in the in the ability to command just over the last seven years, and that represents an increase uh, in number. Uh, just for perspective for the audience out there, I know your audience is is very well acquainted with statistical uh, significance. For perspective, that 150 plus over the last seven years is a com is compared against about 30, I think it was 33 or 34 commanders that had been removed for the same reasons from 1962 until 2015. So looking at what we've got going on internally with the United States military, the activation of guard units in California, New Mexico, uh, Texas just recently, the activation of cybersecurity units out of Arizona, uh, it very much looks like we have you know movement in the background that we can't uh, really assign a specific rhyme or reason to, but we can observe its highly unusual nature. And we have to acknowledge that when conditions present themselves that are highly unusual and yet obvious on their face in some regards, we have to be willing to entertain extraordinary possibilities. President Trump told us on the 9th of June that he hopes the military revolts at the voting booth. And that was a powerful statement to make because the, the mainstream pre, uh, prostitute media hangs on President Trump's every syllable, uh, constantly seeking a way to try and malign or deride that public image. And to use a statement like that and to say it twice, he actually he actually said the the beginning part of the statement twice and, and teed it up for emphasis, emphasis with the crowd and then quickly segued into a completely different topic, which we know as a as a cognitive redirect here in the irregular warfare community. Um, we've got something going on here that is clearly going to tie back to financial events in some regards, clearly going to tie back to Supreme Court precedent. Uh, we're going to have to have some of this codified for our constitutional scaffolding moving forward. And by the end of the day, John, I think we're going to have a very, very different landscape uh, towards the end of November and 1st of December of this year than we've ever had before in all of American history. I, of that, I'm sure, SG, absolutely. And uh, thank you for, for going again into very important details with respect to National Guard and how it ties into the the amalgam of everything else, because it actually, uh, again, segues or dovetails into my one of my last questions for you for the day, which is, last week it came out that Judge Shukton's order to deny presidential immunity, President Trump's January 6th case has been vacated following the Supreme Court ruling. Additionally, the court has awarded him 3.3 million plus in settlement. What do you make of this? And what does this mean for the future of the Supreme Court? Are we looking at a case where Clarence Thomas may be the only viably remaining member? I think one of the things that will be necessary to engage uh, preservation activities of the Republic is to see a failure of all three branches of government at the federal level and all state branches of government or all state uh, levels of government at any at enough of a significant level. Uh, that we cross over the Rubicon, so to speak, with the need to restore, uh, you know, civil society and civil order and, and keep the country from quite literally breaking down. So by definition, when we work backwards from that, and this is something that, you know, sometimes patriots take to their chagrin a little bit, and I, and I understand why, but to move us across that threshold and into that territory where we can handle the real nature of the entrenchment, we have to see the failure of the court to uphold and defend and preserve and protect the Republic and the Constitution. At the same time, I don't think that we need to see a long, drawn-out process where the legacy of the court is marred forevermore. I think we've already seen a process uh, sort of along those lines over the last four years as the court has um, refused to hear certain issues of, of what I would argue are critically important um, factions. The court, we know, has heard emergency uh, issues and emergency dockets. We've seen at least two publications that managed to leak themselves out online with regards to calendar dates with those. 
Uh, so we know that those decisions have happened. And of course, we've seen the court uphold some good decisions publicly uh, over this last four year period to include Roe versus Wade and a couple of others. But fundamentally, as it pertains to our election system, I think that we're, we're sort of teeing up again, the failure of the court to protect a presidential candidate. Uh, we could very well see the salvation of the court encapsulated in the release of a Brunson decision, you know, immediately on the heels of something like that. And that would provide the basis, of course, to you know require the Manchurian administration to either prove its validity or to step itself down. Uh, and we start getting into that, you know, unprecedented territory when we look into those speculatives, because it could go a number of different ways from that point forward. We know fundamentally, though, that the uh, apparatus of civil society has to break down because the military has to be deployed for a military purpose. Preservation and defense of the nation is a military purpose, but law enforcement operations are not. So we have to transcend uh, simple criminality, I think, in some regards, and move into those very, very uh, long-reaching geopolitical criminal syndicate arenas of operation and something like a failure of an entire branch of government, you know, again, contained within that court would would fit that bill very well. But I'd like to stress for the folks out there once again that I don't think we have to uh, desecrate and continually mar that legacy moving forward. I think there's going to be a redemption moment, quite frankly, for all of our various governmental branches as we move through the breakdown of our society, the pause of our society, and then the rebuilding, the reconstructing, and the very deliberate clean out uh, and, and what I would argue you know, cleaning up really of our of our nation moving forward. Yeah, I agree. I think you're you're right. I think there'll be a, an about face that goes on with respect to the Supreme Court and actually through all the agencies respectively. So I think that's a good place to end for now, at SG. So at, as always, um, if you last parting thoughts you have for our audience and where can people find your work? I can be found in three places. I'm on Truth Social at the handle Real SGNon with a red check. I'm on Twitter X now at the handle the T H E Q News Patriot, and I can be found on Rumble.com/slash user/slash Q News Patriot. I'm not on Rumble by SGNon. And with respect to closing thoughts, John, I think my closing thoughts are going to be that you know while we talk about these landscape for us and we talk about turbulence ahead and we talk about you know, the the destructuring of the old system and the restructuring and the transitioning into a new system. We're talking about, you know, on these types of broadcasts, the corruption within our legal spaces and our legal dimensions, our financial and business dimensions, certainly our government. A spiritual process is actually taking place in and throughout all of that. What we're experiencing here in North America and in the Western world is essentially a, a humbling moment that very much echoes that passage. I think it's taken out of Second Chronicles chapter 7. We have become a sort of a haughty society in some ways. And post-COVID, within that post-COVID landscape, we've begun to realize that it really is about our communities. It really is about each other. We have to have our backs collectively together. And we have to be willing to administer the trust of our government, the trust of our representatives, the trust of those uh, in and around us who are given any sort of authority whatsoever in a transparent, common law, fair and just uh, sort of way. And we've gotten very far away from that. So in unentrenching the evil that has manipulated us out of our natural balance and into this adversarial state, uh, sometimes with one another, you know, we've seen the, the, you know, desecration of the nuclear family unit, the war on various demographic communities, the artificial divisions that were heavily pushed and heavily or originated and then heavily pushed by CIA programs throughout the entertainment industry, especially, you know, we're, we're sort of reckoning with all of that and bringing that to uh, a dissolved and and agreeable and unified way. This is a very very exciting journey, despite the discomfort, despite the turbulence that we have, you know, you know, had along the way. And we have to remember that there's going to be, I think, a tremendous amount of uh, positive work and and expectant things to be looking forward to after we get through this difficult period that lays before us. Agreed, and I I, I can't stress the importance SG of enough of what you said about community and synergy and, and our biggest strength is is our unification as a society uh, as you mentioned the deep state has gone to great pains to divide us we talk a lot about that in our our various shows with our audience and so i'm glad that you're reverberating that sentiment and folks as you've heard sg talk about 
the importance of oneness and community. We also, of course, agree with that likewise, which is why we've developed a channel called the Club Patriot, which is wholly designed to galvanize the community, both within the communal space and the business space. So if you're looking to be a part of the community for free, we do have that section. It's like a Discord chat room where you can all talk with each other, share the open ideas in exchange of opinions and beliefs, recipes, whatever, whatever strikes your fancy. If you are looking to do business deals in terms of uh, maybe you have a product or a service or a patent or something where you want to get with other business owners, maybe they're further along the process, you want to do a channel partnership alliance, or maybe just merge or, or whatever the case may be, there's an open opportunity within that. Uh, we're helping people get out of the matrix, being able to homeschool their kids and re-educate them the proper way instead of the Rockefeller cabal construct that was thrust upon all of us as children in the public educational system. So if you want that, we will leave the link in the description there. SG, thanks for joining us. Good, sir. We look forward to having you on once again, September. Appreciate all of your valuable information. Pray you have a blessed rest of your day. God bless, my friend. Thank you for having me back. Have a great day. You too.